Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, I extend my special welcome to the representatives of civil society, uh, member states, and the entities of the United Nations attending this site event. I'm a Prime Minister Ambassador of the United Nations, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, for the panel discussion entitled From Empowerment to Sustainability Financing to the Sheep and Health for Rural Women. Uh, it is indeed a privilege uh, to meet you and to uh, see so many familiar faces in the course of the 56th session of the Commission on the Status of Women and to be back to this professional uh, circle of gender equality advocates from all walks of life. It is not new to say that there are interlinkages between many aspects of women's lives and uh, how progress or lack of progress in one area can uh, accelerate or hinder progress in another. These interdependencies have received uh, increasing attention in recent years uh, as we have uh, endeavored to meet the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, we all recognize that gender equality and empowerment of women are both goals by themselves as well as means for achieving sustainable development goals. This recognition is of particular importance as we move towards Rio Conference to be held in June. I'm very proud that the Mission of Armenia is one of the co-sponsors of today's panel discussion, and I do appreciate uh, the role and participation of civil society and the NGOs in this important exercise since they effectively advocate lobby and also pressure where necessary the governments and other stakeholders to do the right thing. In this context, I am honored to, to have representatives of the CIS WNGO Forum, Women World Banking, and the Armenian Relief Society. I also thank Ambassador Meryl Frank for kindly agreeing to be a part of today's discussion and sharing her experience and knowledge on this important subject. Dear friends, the international community has made a strong and comprehensive commitment to women's economic empowerment, uh, most notably at the Fourth World Conference on Women in 1995, the 23rd Special Session of the General Assembly in 2000, the 2005 World Summit and Follow-up International Conference on Financing for Development to review the implementation of Monterey Consensus in 2008. The recent outcomes of the Commission on the Status of Women since I had the privilege of chairing uh, in 2009 and 2010 this important body, uh, have also addressed the issues within the context of priority themes and have focused on gender sensitive microeconomic policies, employment opportunities for women, and women's equal access to and control over financial and economic resources and markets. There is an increasing recognition of implications of financial and economic crisis on gender equality and, and development. Women's economic empowerment entails increasing women's access to economic and financial resources in broad sense, including resource generated at national level through budgets, trade, and development assistance, productive resources such as land and property, and social protection, employment, as well as financial services such as savings, credit, and remittances, transfers. The latter is of important, this is particularly important for, for my country, Armenia, since we have very specific demography, uh, with two-thirds of, of its population living outside Armenia, and comprising the diaspora whose representatives are also present in this room. Without access to economic resources, so women uh, simply lack protection, and in particular, rural women who continue to be absent from key decision-making processes, shaping the allocation of economic and financial resources and opportunities. On international and uh, regional levels, a variety of approaches are needed to promote rural women's economic empowerment. This includes development of uh, of concepts and uh, regulations of women's capabilities to adapt and changing the, uh, to changing labor market conditions. On national levels, uh, perhaps we could uh, concentrate on support to reduce unpaid uh, care work and gender-sensitive labor market regulations. 
Uh, in the rural context, uh, land reform, uh, land titling projects are also critical in addressing gender inequalities in access to land and property. In some countries, including Armenia, the global financial crisis has resulted in a decline in resources available for promoting gender equality and has caused a shift in priorities, unfortunately, resulting in diversion of funds from projects aimed at gender equality promotion in rural areas. I think we should see uh, the present day economic challenges uh, as an opportunity to strengthen gender responsive policies on national level because not addressing gender issues will only exacerbate um, the existing crises. And this is why we believe that today's panel discussion is timely and important. We must have strategies uh, with adequate gender analysis and well-intentioned targeted programs with the participation of all stakeholders, including governments, civil society, uh, the international and financial institutions. Dear friends, on behalf of all co-sponsors, uh, this event, I once again thank you for joining us uh, this morning. And without delay, I give the floor uh, to our moderator, uh, Sun Yong Yoon, chair of the CSW Forum, to introduce the distinguished panelists and their presentations. And I wish you an interesting and productive discussion. Looking forward for your active participation. Thank you. Sorry for those opening words. Uh, those who have been at the CSW in previous years remember his excellent and um, <laughs> very heartfelt um, and sincere support of the uh, NGOs at the CSW process. I would like to applaud his uh, stewardship of past years. Uh, introduce our panelists. Let me just give you an idea of how we will proceed today. Um, each of the panelists will say a few opening remarks for about 10 minutes, and then uh, we will have a chance for discussion between the panelists, if that's what they would like to do, for a few moments, and then we will open to the floor. Uh, at these meetings, it is often the case that um, we end the panel, and then everyone scrambles to come up and ask their real questions. <laughs> and they also try to network around the room. So today what I propose is that maybe we stop a little bit short of our end of our time, and that we spend a few moments doing just that, if that's what you would like to do. We, at the NGO side, are calling these conversations. And sometimes they're the most important part of what gets done. Okay, so we'll have to keep a little strictly to the time to make that, uh, that timeline, but let's begin. Let me introduce our distinguished panelists here. Uh, Ambassador Meryl Frank is to my left. She is uh, currently the president and CEO of Makeda Global. She's a former mayor of Highland Park in New Jersey, my home state. Her firm provides expert research, analysis, and training in governance participation, and gender equality issues. She was appointed by our President Obama to the U.S., to the UNCSW, and represented us at the CSW for two years. Stephanie uh, Killian is to her left. She is Director of Global Resources for J Intersect. We'll let her explain what the J part means. Leading teams based in the U.S. and Asia, directing research and analysis in global development. She has also served as the chairperson of the Armenian Relief Society UN Committee since 2010. Mary Ellen Iskandarian is president and CEO of Women's World Banking, the world's largest network of microfinance institutions and banks. Prior to this, she served in another bank, called the World Bank, Lehman Brothers, and is a permanent member of the Council of Foreign Relations. She is also an advisor for girls and women for the Clinton Global Initiative last year. With that, I would like to give the floor to uh, Ambassador Frank to start her comments, and she knows how to use these microphones. Yeah, I think you can use the microphone. I hope you don't mind if I stand up. Okay. Is this working? As long as it's working. Good morning. Not working? No. Good no. morning. 
Um, I hope you don't mind if I stand up. What I do is I go around the world and I train women to speak. And I just want to start you off all with a training. I'm five foot one. Look what happens when I sit down. <laughs> Same with you, you're leaning on the desk. So I'm going to stand up. Also, women have weaker voices often than men. And when we stand up like an opera singer, we can project our voices better. So, I, I yes, we hear is that you. okay? <laughs> all right. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, and first of all, thank the panelists and the members of civil society and friends here. Um, a little bit about myself, because I think it's relevant to rural women and local government. Um, I, at 18 years old, I said that I wanted to be the ambassador for women's issues to the UN. <laughs> I was appointed at 50 years old. <laughs> and it's the typical route a woman takes. You know, we are not, you know, often you see a, men, a man's career like a super highway. They know what they want to do, it's a career choice, and they go that way. Women, on the other hand, and I'm talking women all over the world, have their lives, and it's more like there's detours, and, and they may get to where they want to go. But in my case, I was an at-home mother to my four children for 12 years. I see a lot of heads shaking. <laughs> um, and then, because I got angry about something, I decided to run for local government. I decided because of issues about my children. And I ran for local government against a member of my own party and with no money. I ran and I won big time and had to run three times and won each time. This, by the way, is very typical of women. Men run as a career choice. Women run because they get angry. <laughs> so I have served government in the local government but I've also been appointed. As I said, when I was 50 years old, I was appointed by President Obama. But what I found was it's a great honor to serve as an ambassador and to have the United States in front of my name. But what I learned was my real passion and what I really care about is working with women. And it's about democracy, it's about opportunity. And so what I do now is I travel all over the world and I work, for example, in Afghanistan with the women members of parliament. I work in Jordan with the women members of parliament. I work in Kenya with basket weavers and with widows. These are leaders too. I work in Malawi with members of parliament and in Morocco and other countries with women that are interested in appointed office. So I have a feeling for what's going on around the world. And I don't travel as an American ambassador. I travel as a woman who's had experiences all over the world, and I want to share those experiences with other women. I was asked last year to come to Armenia and keynote the first national conference on women and politics. I <laughs> My Armenian earrings prove <laughs> that I was in Europe. Um, Armenia was very, very interesting to me and different than any other country that I've been in. Our, the women at this conference, by the way, they were expecting 150, paid for lunch for 150, and 300 women came. They were not happy that there was not enough food by the way. <laughs> But 300 women came, and what I found in Armenia was odd. Women are very well educated in Armenia. Women are very capable and confident in Armenia. But what was different about Armenia was they had no representation at all. Now I have a, four, a, a couple of papers, I only have 30 copies. Um, they're two pages each and I wanted to hand them out um, can you hand them this way? Two pages each. Now, as I said, what I found in Armenia was these women were smart and capable and ready to hold office, which isn't always true. Often when I travel to places, even the women members of parliament need a lot of training. They need to learn about governing. 
They need to learn about speaking in public. It's one of their greatest fears. They need to learn about they need to learn about how to balance the role of a member of parliament or a leader. That is constituent relations, which for women often takes more of their time than governing. Of course, they need to learn about governing. And the third part that they need to learn is about a work-family balance, because that can be very, very difficult. In Armenia, as I said, these women were very well educated and very competent. So there really was no good reason why Armenia had a problem with this. Now, I'm going to name some names of countries, and I want you to think about this. And tell me if you think that Armenia ranks better, worse, or in the group with this group. Mm -hmm. Cambodia, Tunisia, Tajikistan, Albania, Azerbaijan, <coughs> Bangladesh, Uruguay, Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan, Panama, Uruguay, and Burundi. <coughs> Anyone have an idea? They all do, and they all rank better internationally than Armenia. Armenia ranks 108 in political participation out of 135 countries studied by the World Economic Forum. This doesn't make sense. Those of you who know Armenia, let me ask you, does this make sense? No. Okay. However, you shouldn't worry because Armenia ranks just after Chad and does better than Kuwait, Fiji, Bahrain, Qatar, and Oman. And I forgot to turn my cell phone off. Just a minute. <laughs> yeah, that's my ring. It's Qatar. Um, so, so they do better than those countries. By the way, Afghanistan has 26% of their parliament is women. In Armenia, about 9% is women. That is 119 men and 12 females. Now, when, while I was there, this group of women, 200 women, came up with a women's legislative agenda, their priorities. And they recommended that the quota for women be changed and that the quota be 30%. Fortunately, we now know that the quota is going to be 20%. That's enormous for Armenia. Now, what is also interesting about Armenia is even at the local level, there's not very many women. I believe there's 13 mayors out of 588 municipalities that are women. That, this, is, this is a problem because this is the breeding ground for women. This is where women learn to govern. If you take women, as many countries do, and there's a quota and they are voted into office, they very often have no experience governing. So it's very hard for them to be successful. They don't know the ropes. They haven't been there before. This is why local government is so important. It's such a great place for them to learn the ropes. But if you don't have them coming up, then they're going to be left in a situation where it's very hard to be successful as a member of parliament. Now, in my case, I work with these women. I do training. I, we talk about how it would work for them and how other women around the world learn to legislate and do constituent relations and, again, the work-family balance. Um, on the, when you look at this issue, the issue of women as members of parliament, the, women, the issue of women as governing, it's very important not to make the argument that this is about equality, or it's about justice, or it's about human rights. Because in fact, this is about having a better government. The studies show in Norway that when you have women on boards, and whether that's in government or private industry, the boards do better. In private industry, they're more profitable because women are on the boards. Women balance. Women tend to be less, less um, risk averse, or more risk averse as men. So the idea here is that you have a balance of perspectives on boards, including women's boards, by the way. You're looking for as much input and as much diversity of opinion as you can get to make good decisions. And that 
includes not just business and profits, but governing a country. Now what's happening in Armenia is the lack of women means that the country is, is, having, is not doing and not as productive as it should be. And in this case, there are more educated women than educated men, but they're not moving up. In fact, even in fields, for example, in education, where 90% of the teachers are women, this is true everywhere, by the way, the minister is a man and the high level positions are held by men. We have to, what we're doing in some countries is working with women on appointed office. And we will be having an international meeting, the first in the world on this. There are many programs that train women for elected office. This is the first that trains women for appointed office. And in the case of Armenia, with such well-educated women, there should be no reason why there are only two members of the cabinet, which is 18 people in the government. Only two are women. Now what we do is look for women who have great credentials, who know their fields, <laughs> who know their fields and would be wonderful ministers. And what this group has done is to train them as well. Because very often when people, men and women, have technical skills, they don't have governance skills. They don't know how to speak in public. They don't know how to work as a member of government. And so what we do is we work with those women to have a really, to have a strength there, and then provide the government and the parties with lists of qualified women. So they can no longer say to us, there's no qualified women, which I'm sure you've all heard. Now this is a very new approach, and I said the, as I said, the only in the world. So I would recommend to Armenia, first of all, that if there was tremendous interest in this conference held last year, that there is tremendous interest in the entire population. This was middle-aged women, it was younger women, it was older women. And by the way, because a woman is 45, does not mean she's dead. <laughs> you know, we, we spend all of our money training young women, which is very important. But women that are older, their children are grown, and they have life experience, and we should be focusing on them as well. But that my recommendations are that Armenia take advantage of this tremendous resource, that they look at women for local elected office, that they look at women for national elected office, for women for local appointed office and national appointed office. And I would be very happy to be part of that. And I thank all of you for the opportunity to speak to you today. reminded that uh, women's uh, leadership does not necessarily advance with industrialization. Yes. And that probably includes the United States. Yes. And that uh, certainly uh, includes many countries of Europe. Uh, our next speaker, I will call upon Stephanie uh, Killian. Thank you, Dr. Yoon, Ambassador Nazarian, Ambassador Frank, Mrs. Kandarian. First, I would like to thank the ambassador and the team at the Armenian Mission for organizing this event and inviting the Armenian Relief Society to be a part. Additionally, 20 years ago today, on March 2nd, 1992, Armenia joined the United Nations as a free and independent state. It is a proud day for all Armenians and for all those who believe in democracy. Secondly, on behalf of the Armenian Relief Society, I would like to congratulate Dr. Yoon and the NGO CSW New York for a well-planned, numerous, and interesting events during this commission that have provided a voice for NGOs in a forum to learn, advance our mission, and partner with like-minded individuals and groups. Also, happy 40th anniversary. Lastly, we congratulate UN Women on their first full year of operations. We embrace the vision of UN Women to meet the needs of the world's women. As the Commission stresses the centrality of gender equality in women's empowerment and sustainable development, so too do those two principles permeate 
throughout the work of the Armenian Relief Society. Further, as the title of this panel states, from empowerment to sustainability, so too is the growth of our more than 100-year-old organization. The Armenian Relief Society began in 1910 in New York City, created out of the need to assist newly arriving Armenian immigrants, and just a few years later to settle survivors of the Armenian Genocide who came to the United States seeking asylum and a new life. Throughout the 20th century, the ARS grew across the US and Canada in communities where Armenians rebuilt their lives and the organization also expanded overseas first in the Middle East, then to Europe, Asia, and South America. Today, we have 15,000 members with 220 chapters in 27 countries. Our membership supports the education, health, and social welfare of Armenian communities worldwide, also serving the greater global community with special appropriations for food, medicine, and clothing in times of war, epidemic, or natural disaster. The Armenian Relief Society brings aid to all persons in need, including those with illness or disabilities, prisoners of war, orphans, and refugees. Since Armenia's independence in 1991, the government of Armenia has been an important partner in facilitating our work in the homeland. As the ARS expanded worldwide, we can view this growth in the context of empowerment. Although founded by a man, and throughout our history and currently, we have male members, the organization essentially gave voice to the Armenian woman. From the beginning, our creation as a humanitarian organization captured the nature of the Armenian woman to care and nurture and her uncanny ability to organize and plan. These qualities, however, we believe are present in all women of the world, especially rural women and those stuck in poverty who must run their households, oftentimes creating something out of nothing. As a side note, growing up as an Armenian American, I was fortunate to be surrounded by the strength of Armenian women and to have the opportunities that this country provided, namely freedom and equality. However, I learned just this week that Armenian culture has for its history afforded women those same rights. For example, in the Constitution of the First Republic of Armenia from 1918 to 1921, the right to, vote was, the right to vote for women was not included because it was already part of the fabric of that nation. It was a born right, but I digress. Our work with the United Nations began in the 1970s, first with the Department of Public Information and in 1998 on the roster with the Economic and Social Council. Our advancing role as a civil society actor has been invaluable in expanding our mission and to reach those in need. The UN has diversified that same mission, gratefully, to include issues of global importance like climate change and the environment, to provide specialized focus to our work with the Millennium Development Goals, and to offer a practically infinite platform for opportunities to benefit our cause and to act responsibly as a global citizen. The United Nations has been key to the Armenian Relief Society's empowerment. As the Armenian Relief Society celebrated its centennial in 2010, we looked back proudly at 100 years of achievements. However, it was clear that we needed to harness our empowerment and become an organization for the 21st century, to evolve from the notion of a global charity to a sustainable philanthropic organization. At the Armenian Relief Society, we are following the path of women of the world. Underlying our work across the globe is the consideration of health and well-being, and we heed women's health as the foundation for empowerment, independence, and development. It is well known that throughout the world, women are responsible for the well-being of their families, and that gender roles differ dramatically across cultures, locales, and even in individual households. Women have different needs than men during the course of their lifetime, and these needs may be exacerbated by demographics. Rural women especially face great challenges due to location and mobility that affect their basic human rights, including access to food, water, and sanitation. Rural populations are less educated, have less access to health care, 
exhibit more chronic diseases, and are more likely to be excluded from financial services. Couple a woman's role as a caregiver with that of income generator, and the stakes rise exponentially. The health of families and communities, including financial health, are tied to the health of women. The illness or death of a woman has serious and far-reaching consequences for the health of her children, family, and community. Research has shown that health care costs exert the most financial pressure on poor families. Medical emergencies can place huge burdens on a household's already difficult existence. Access to health services and health protection is a key component of the fight against poverty, as good health is a major driver of economic development and a necessity to alleviate poverty. With maternal conditions as the leading cause of death and disability, Ability among women, in 1997, the ARS inaugurated the Mother and Child Health Care Center in northern Armenia in a town called Akurian, some 30 miles outside Gumri, the epicenter of Armenia's devastating earthquake in 1988. First established as an emergency medical center immediately following the earthquake, it was transformed into a medical center providing the population within a 60-kilometer distance approximately 60,000 people, with free post, pre- and postnatal care for women and infants. The center's professional services brought noticeable improvement to the health of women and children, ensuring normal pregnancies, reducing post-delivery risk and complications, contributing to the decrease of infant mortality rates, and offering gynecological and pediatric care. In 2005, a birthing center was established adjacent to the medical center as prior women were cared for up to and following delivery. Since 2005, the birthing center had, has averaged 1,000 births per year with zero infant or maternal mortality. In 2008, a dental clinic was added to ensure the oral health of women, especially during pregnancy. The ARS Mother and Child Healthcare and Birthing Center is furnished with modern medical equipment, has a self-reliant heating and power supply systems, child care, gynecological, sonographic, mammographic, and first aid units. It has an ambulatory service, a modern laboratory, and a pharmacy. The center provides health education related to pregnancy and infant care, and has the only digital CAT scan machine serving the entire northern part of Armenia. Additionally, it is one of the first two centers in Armenia to implement a fully computerized record-keeping system for patients' medical and financial information. With an average of more than 1,000 patients visiting the ARS Mother and Child Healthcare and Birthing Center each year, it is one of our most successful initiatives in advancing access and providing healthcare to those in need. As the Armenian Relief Society transitions to a global, sustainable humanitarian organization, we are looking to expand operations to include more partnerships with governments, other NGOs, and the private sector. We also are looking to different programs and schemes, like microfinance, to multiply impact and performance. Research has shown that health indicators like infant mortality, water sanitation, and diarrhea-related deaths and also food security, improve in areas with microfinance and microcredit services. Creating a development equation of microfinance, including microcredit, savings, and insurance, with investing in health care for all women living in poverty, will produce results that will positively impact all areas of a woman's life, her family, and her community. Financial inclusion and health care are complementary and must be regarded in a comprehensive solution to poverty. In some cases, delivering services in tandem, like health education with credit services, increases the impact of both. Additionally, as the Armenian Relief Society looks toward a sustainable future, we embrace a whole person and whole society approach. It is clear that human beings and human rights cannot advance without regard and respect to our environment. We are looking forward to the Rio Conference on Sustainable Development in June, where our South American counterparts will participate alongside the governments of Armenia and the United States and others. Again, we recognize and value the work of UN Women in the United Nations system and applaud everyone in this room for your attendance 
and your commitment to the advancement of women. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, for that uh, glimpse through an NGO to almost an entire country. Thank you very much. Uh, Mary Ellen? <laughs> Dr. Yoon, Ambassador Nazarian, Ambassador Frank, and Ms. Killian, it's a great pleasure to join you uh, on this panel today. But I, I really owe a very special thank you to Stephanie for setting up my remarks so beautifully. Um, I thought, yeah, no, it, it, you would have thought we planned it this way. Um, I think the point that she made about the role of caregiver combined with income generator was, was such a powerful remark, and I really see Women's World Banking and the 39 financial institutions that we work with in 27 developing countries as being dedicated to helping women really maximize all that they can um, from both of those roles. We are serving 26 million clients globally through those institutions with Women's World Banking, and 80% of those clients are women. Now, a few years ago, I wouldn't have even bothered to, to, to hit the pause button and tell you about the 80% of the of women because microfinance has so, for so long been associated with women's economic empowerment. But to the point that Dr. Yoon alluded to earlier as well, as microfinance has become much more commercialized in the last decade, we have unfortunately seen a real trend away from women as clients and women as leaders in microfinance institutions. And so Women's World Banking really has rededicated itself to not only making it possible for financial institutions to do that by providing technical assistance and product design and a whole range of other services, but really proving to them something that is, is perfectly self-evident, that banking on women and continuing to focus on women clients is very, very good business for them to be continued to focus on. And then how wonderful to be able to also have so many positive social impacts through that continued focus on women. Women's World Banking it specializes in providing uh, access to a range of products. Again, Stephanie alluded to many of them. Not only credit, although credit is, is tremendously important for women entrepreneurs, but also savings products, insurance products, pension products. But it's particularly important that financial institutions recognize that women in all countries, develop, in developing as well, um, interact with the financial sector much more so than men do as they go through the various stages of their life cycle. And so the financial institution who thinks about financial products and services with their life cycle needs, birth, birth of children, building a house, getting married, the marriage of children, uh, old age, unfortunately death, um, really are going to be much better aligned with the, the ways that their female clients approach the financial <coughs> sector. And they also need to be very focused on certain particular product attributes that while they may be nice for male clients to have, they're absolutely essential for women to interact with your financial institution and, and take ownership of this product. And WWB's research goes in great detail in the field. We've got, I think, probably the, the, the one benefit of the financial crisis for our organization is the, the incredible talent we've been able to attract in from the consumer product sector or the financial services sector, people who really know marketing skills and how to listen to clients and what's really behind the expression of a client's need. So just maybe to share a couple of the, the product attributes that we found that a financial institution that's committed to serving women really needs to take into consideration when it approaches um, those products. We really must pay attention to respecting what it is that women value and acknowledging the one thing that every woman wants, and that is more time. Um, <laughs> she, she wants, she, again, much more than men, really prizes convenience in the delivery of her of, of uh, financial products and services. Just a, a quick anecdote, there's a, a, a wonderful um, financial diary study that's just been published about a bank called Opportunity Bank in Malawi. 
And they have these vans that go around to different villages on a, on a fixed schedule, and they have ATMs and tellers and all, provide a whole range of financial services and financial education through these vans. And they were doing a study, 200 participants equally divided between men and women. And the men participants in the study were willing to spend up to $7.90 in transportation costs to take a bus and go into town to deposit often far less than $7.90. Whereas the women said, the van will be here tomorrow. I can wait. I can deposit my money tomorrow. So that, that sort of prizing that, that convenience and, and time. It's also why we're so excited about the possibilities for mobile technology. And as we've all seen, there's great opportunity for cell phone banking. But again, let's not forget that of the 4.3 billion cell phone subscribers in the world, there are 300 million less women with access to cell phones. So you always have to look through that lens. What, what do you have to take into consideration when you're thinking about approaching a woman? The other thing that we've just been t completely struck by in our, our market research is that absolute essentiality, particularly when you're thinking about savings projects, of confidentiality. Women want to be able to save in a safe, secure place, and, and they view banks as being a, a, a place to do that. But they need to know that their husbands, their fa uh, family members, their neighbors don't necessarily know that they're saving or how much they're saving. And so that, that need for confidentiality is, is absolutely, uh, absolutely prime. There's some other things you need to take into consideration just in, in basic product design and, and remembering that, that financial education and explaining how these products work is an obligation that a financial institution has, particularly to its low-income clients. And so remembering that, that far too often so many of our women clients are illiterate. And so when you think about a form or a marketing brochure that an illiterate client is going to get, you just have to think in different terms, think in more visual terms, think in, in explanations. These are not stupid women. They are just perhaps women that can't read the marketing document that you would give to a man or to a, a, another client. You also have to be very careful about structuring particularly loans where you're requiring collateral or documentation that, again, women may be far less likely to have access to. As we've talked about with a couple of the panelists, it's far less likely that a woman would have access to property title or be able to pledge property as a guarantee for a loan. She's also far less likely to get someone to stand up and guarantee that loan for her. We've seen anecdotally in Pakistan that men in the marketplace would be more willing to guarantee a loan for a competitor, male, than they would for a, a woman doing a completely different business. So we have to be very, very careful when we're thinking about ways that we're going to design these products. And then, then lastly, just again, we've, we've touched on it with the other speakers, thinking about cultural issues and how, when I talked to you earlier about the, the power of marketing, how does marketing work in different cultures and what are powerful motivators in, in, different, in different cultures? One thing that we've been very exciting in seeing with some of our network members is in their branding of their institutions as the financial provider for women, they can at the same time really present a picture of women as empowered, ambitious uh, economic agents in, in their own right. And, and there have been some marvelous stories of, of women who never really saw themselves in that way, but then there's a TV commercial that's, that's telling them that they are, and they're recognizing themselves in that in that commercial. So it's very important to think about the, the power of the, the power of, of those images. Um, and then I thought I would just talk very briefly, and I know we're, we're bumping up against time constraints, about three projects in, in some uh, various countries in different parts of the world that we're working on that I thought might touch on the, the rural issue, the health issue, and then um, and then this, this issue of having financial autonomy in, in, in your own name. Um, Microfinance hasn't been that friendly to rural populations, and I have a feeling there might be some NGOs in this, this uh, room who've experienced that. Microfinance has worked often in very rigid ways that you repay a fixed amount every two weeks, and it's a very, very set loan structure. Well, anybody who's ever done any farming knows that that's not the way farming works. You have very lumpy cash flows. You need a big chunk of money at the beginning of a period, and then you get this 
big windfall of money at the end of the period, but you might not have a whole lot of cash flow in between. And so microfinance in general hasn't been very helpful at, to, to rural areas. And as the industry thinks about moving out to these more remote populations, as technology makes these more remote populations possible, we've got to be careful to put that gender lens on, once again, as we're planning to, to think about what these products look like. And the, the country where we're doing um, some, uh, I think, really fascinating work, and we've just completed the market research, is um, in Paraguay, where we were working with our, our network member institution there to reach um, both women and men farmers. And they, our, our research team went out to, to several villages. And without exception, we would go onto a farm. The husband would be farming cash crops. The women would have the chickens and the livestock, and the you know they'd go to town to sell the eggs. They would make the salsa. They you know they had all these ongoing products that were earning money. But when we talked to them, they'd say the women themselves would identify as I am just a housewife and I make no contribution financially to the household. But what did we find? Seventy percent of the cash that was coming in month after month was coming in from those chickens, eggs, and salsa. And so to some degree, our own sense of our own agency needs to be, um, you know, needs to be our responsibility. But at the same time, we can, we at Women's World Banking can certainly work with financial institutions to look beyond that woman's self-description of what she's contributing to the household. The financial institution that we're working with is so excited. They think they've discovered this, this truly hidden market, and they'll have a real, really differentiated advantage over other financial institutions. Um, I, I must say a word about our very exciting um, microinsurance, health microinsurance product in, in Jordan, because it again touches on so many of the issues that, that uh, Stephanie mentioned. Um, we, were, we were seeing and hearing from women all over the world that they were losing time away from their businesses to take care of sick child or sick, sick spouse. And it was also the number one reason worldwide that microenterprises were being liquidated or decapitalized to cover these unexpected health emergencies. So we went to our most innovative network member in Jordan and piloted a product that for a, a fraction of what the women were already saving every month because they were so fearful of emergencies, for a fraction of that amount, they're paying a monthly premium and they earn a per diem up to 30 days for any time away that they are spending from their business to take care of a sick child or a sick spouse or for their own illness. Now when we were doing the market research, all we heard about was caregiver. And that, in fact, is the name of the policy that we, we designed. What has been fascinating since April 2010 when we rolled the product out, we've sold 52,000 product um, policies. There are about 2,100 claims and fully half of those claims were used by the women themselves for complications during pregnancy. And so it just made such a powerful point. When women are given good choices and good tools, they will take them up. And so we've been very excited about the, pop, the possibility of now moving this product to other countries. We'll be going to Peru this year with the policy. So I think there's, there's a great demand on the part of financial institutions to learn more about how to dev devise products that meet women's needs. I was going to tell you about one more country, but I, my time is up, and I, I'm hoping that maybe we'll get to work it into the conversation. Thank you so much. I think we would all like to uh, take out accounts on your bank. <laughs> uh, I'm going to invite uh, Ambassador Nazarian to uh, make a few comments uh, that he might like to make uh, on any of the presentations, and then the three of you can think of questions you might want to ask each other. Uh, thank you, and um, let me first uh, uh, appreciate it for this frank and uh, open discussion on uh, women's political and public participation in our medium. As a government, we are uh, open to this kind of uh, sincere uh, endeavors, discussions, uh, and sometimes even criticism. Uh, that uh, you know that makes my country different from those uh, that Ambassador Frank uh, mentioned, uh, and places Armenia high on the list uh, in the context of uh, human rights and fundamental freedoms. We will continue the practice of holding uh, this kind of uh, conferences, events in Armenia and outside Armenia, 
uh, to improve the public awareness and also provoke more discussions within the uh, society. Uh, also, Stephanie referred to our ministry's 20th anniversary uh, membership to the United Nations, and uh, thank you for the kind words. Uh, our past and current membership uh, to the United Nations, uh, the different bodies, uh, have allowed uh, us to actively contribute uh, along with other member states on social, economic, and uh, sustainable development matters. Uh, our news chairmanship in particular under the Commission on Human Rights, uh, oops, our Commission on Status of Women uh, during the 2009 and 2011 period reflected our continued commitment also on the gender equality uh, matters. Uh, we are looking forward uh, for an effective partnership with the Armenian Relief Society and the Women World Banking. Uh, and uh, we are interested also to study your uh, analysis um, and research, especially those related to the low income countries, and to see uh, to what extent we can make it applicable uh, in the context of microeconomic uh, projects. So perhaps I'll stop here and allow others to. Access to a range of products. Again, Stephanie alluded to many of them. Not only credit, although credit is, is tremendously important for women entrepreneurs, but also savings products, insurance products, pension products. But it's particularly important that financial institutions recognize that women in all countries, developed in developing as well, um, interact with the financial sector much more so than men do as they go through the various stages of their life cycle. And so the financial institution who thinks about financial products and services with their life cycle needs, birth, birth of children, building a house, getting married, the marriage of children, uh, old age, unfortunately death, um, really are going to be much better aligned with the, the ways that their female clients approach the financial <coughs> sector. And they also need to be very focused on certain particular product attributes that while they may be nice for male clients to have, they're absolutely essential for women to interact with your financial institution and, and take ownership of this product. And WWB's research goes in great detail in the field. We've got, I think, probably the, the, the one benefit of the financial crisis for our organization is the, the incredible talent we've been able to attract in from the consumer product sector, or the financial services sector, people who really know marketing skills and how to listen to clients and what's really behind the expression of a client's need. So just maybe to share a couple of the, the product attributes that we found that a financial institution that's committed to serving women really needs to take into consideration when it approaches um, those products. We really must pay attention to respecting what it is that women value and acknowledging the one thing that every woman wants, and that is more time. Um, <laughs> she, she wants, she, again, much more than men, really prizes convenience in the delivery of her, of, of uh, financial products and services. Just a, a quick anecdote, there's a, a, a wonderful um, financial diary study that's just been published about a bank called Opportunity Bank in Malawi. And they have these vans that go around to different villages on a, on a fixed schedule, and they have ATMs and tellers and all, provide a whole range of financial services and financial education through these vans. And they were doing a study, 200 participants equally divided between men and women. And the men participants in the study were willing to spend up to $7.90 in transportation costs to take a bus and go into town to deposit often far less than $7.90. Whereas the women said, the man will be here tomorrow. I can wait. I can deposit my money tomorrow. So that, that sort of prizing that, that convenience and, and time. It's also why we're so excited about the possibilities for mobile technology. And as we've all seen, there's great opportunity for cell phone banking. But again, let's not forget that of the 4.3 billion cell phone subscribers in the world, there are 300 million less women with access to cell phones. So you always have to look through that lens. What, what do you have to take into consideration when you're thinking about approaching a woman? The other thing that we've just been completely struck by in our, our market research is that 
absolute essentiality, particularly when you're thinking about savings projects, of confidentiality. Women want to be able to save in a safe, secure place, and, and they view banks as being a, a, a place to do that. But they need to know that their husbands, their fa uh, family members, their neighbors don't necessarily know that they're saving or how much they're saving. And so that, that need for confidentiality is, is absolutely, uh, absolutely prime. There's some other things you need to take into consideration just in, in basic product design and, and remembering that, that financial education and explaining how these products work is an obligation that a financial institution has, particularly to its low-income clients. And so remembering that, that far too often so many of our women clients are illiterate. And so when you think about a form or a marketing brochure that an illiterate client is going to get, you just have to think in different terms, think in more visual terms, think in, in explanations. These are not stupid women. They are just perhaps women that can't read the marketing document that you would give to a man or to a, an, another client. You also have to be very careful about structuring particularly loans where you're requiring collateral or documentation that, again, women may be far less likely to have access to. As we've talked about with a couple of the panelists, it's far less likely that a woman would have access <coughs> to property title or be able to pledge property as a guarantee for a loan. She's also far less likely to get someone to stand up and guarantee that loan for her. We've seen anecdotally in Pakistan that men in the marketplace would be more willing to guarantee a loan for a competitor, male, than they would for a, a woman doing a completely different business. So we have to be very, very careful when we're thinking about ways that we're going to de design these products. And then, then lastly, just uh, again, we've, we've touched on it with the other speakers, thinking about cultural issues and how, when I talked to you earlier about the, the power of marketing, how does marketing work in different cultures and what are powerful motivators in, in, different, in different cultures? One thing that we've been very exciting in seeing with some of our network members is in their branding of their institutions as the financial provider for women, they can at the same time really present a picture of women as empowered, ambitious, uh, economic agents in, in their own right. And, and there have been some marvelous stories of, of women who never really saw themselves in that way, but then there's a TV commercial that's, that's telling them that they are, and they're recognizing themselves in that, in that commercial. So it's very important to think about the, the power, of, the power of, of those images. Um, and then I thought I would just talk very briefly, and I know we're, we're bumping up against time constraints, about three projects in, in some, uh, various countries in different parts of the world that we're working on that I thought might touch on the, the rural issue, the health issue, and then, um, and then this, this issue of having financial autonomy in, in, in your own name. Um, microfinance hasn't been that friendly to rural populations, and I have a feeling there might be some NGOs in this, this uh, room who've experienced that. Microfinance has worked often in very rigid ways that you repay a fixed amount every two weeks, and it's a very, very set loan structure. Well, anybody who's ever done any farming knows that that's not the way farming works. You have very lumpy cash flows. You need a big chunk of money at the beginning of a period, and then you get this big windfall of money at the end of the period, but you might not have a whole lot of cash flow in between. And so microfinance in general hasn't been very helpful at, to, to rural areas. And as the industry thinks about moving out to these more remote populations, as technology makes these more remote populations possible, we've got to be careful to put that gender lens on, once again, as we're planning to, to think about what these products look like. And the, the country where we're doing um, some, uh, I think, really fascinating work, and we've just completed the market research, is um, in Paraguay where we were working with our, our network member institution there to reach um, both women and men farmers. And they, our, our research team went out to, to several villages. And without exception, we would go onto a farm. The husband would be farming cash crops. The women would have the chickens and the livestock. And the, you know, they'd go to town to sell the eggs. They would make the salsa. They, you know, they had all these ongoing products that were earning money. But when we talked to them, they'd say, the women themselves would identify as, I am just a housewife, and I make no contribution financially to the household. 
But what did we find? 70% of the cash that was coming in month after month was coming in from those chickens, eggs, and salsa. And so to some degree, our own sense of our own agency needs to be, um, you know, needs to be our responsibility. But at the same time, we can, we at Women's World Banking can certainly work with financial institutions to look beyond that woman's self-description of what she's contributing to the household. The financial institution that we're working with is so excited. They think they've discovered this, this truly hidden market, and they'll have a real, really differentiated advantage over other financial institutions. Um, I, I must say a word about our very exciting um, microinsurance, health microinsurance product in, in Jordan, because it again touches on so many of the issues that, that uh, Stephanie mentioned. Um, we, were, we were seeing and hearing from women all over the world that they were losing time away from their businesses to take care of sick child or sick, sick spouse. And it was also the number one reason worldwide that microenterprises were being liquidated or decapitalized to cover these unexpected health emergencies. So we went to our most innovative network member in Jordan and piloted a product that for a, a fraction of what the women were already saving every month because they were so fearful of emergencies, for a fraction of that amount, they're paying a monthly premium and they earn a per diem up to 30 days for any time away that they are spending from their business to take care of a sick child or a sick spouse or for their own illness. Now when we were doing the market research, all we heard about was caregiver. And that, in fact, is the name of the policy that we, we designed. What has been fascinating since April 2010 when we rolled the product out, we've sold 52,000 product um, policies. There are about 2,100 claims and fully half of those claims were used by the women themselves for complications during pregnancy. And so it just makes such a powerful point. When women are given good choices and good tools, they will take them up. And so we've been very excited about the, po the possibility of now moving this product to other countries. We'll be going to Peru this year with the policy. So I think there's, there's a great demand on the part of financial institutions to learn more about how to develop devise products that meet women's needs. I was going to tell you about one more country, but I, my time is up, and I, I'm hoping that maybe we'll get to work it into the conversation. Thank you so much. I think we would all like to uh, take out accounts on your bank. <laughs> uh, I'm going to invite uh, Ambassador Nazarian to uh, make a few comments uh, that he might like to make uh, on any of the presentations, and then the three of you can think of questions you might want to ask each other. Uh, thank you, and um, let me first uh, uh, appreciate for this frank and uh, open discussion on uh, women's political and public participation in Armenia. As a government, we are uh, open to this kind of uh, sincere uh, endeavors, discussions, uh, and sometimes criticism uh, that, uh, you know, that makes my country different from those uh, that Ambassador Frank uh, mentioned uh, and places Armenia high uh, on the list uh, in the context of uh, human rights and fundamental freedoms. We will continue the practice of holding uh, this kind of uh, conferences, events in Armenia and outside Armenia uh, to improve the public awareness and also provoke more discussions within the, the society. Um, also, Stephanie referred to Armenia's 20th anniversary. Uh, membership to the United Nations, and uh, thank you for the kind words. Uh, our past and current membership uh, to the United Nations, uh, the different bodies, uh, have allowed uh, us to actively contribute uh, along with other member states on social, economic, and uh, sustainable development matters. Uh, our news chairmanship in particular under the Commission on Human Rights, uh, oh, sorry, Commission on Status of Women uh, during the 2009 and 2011 period reflected our on the gender equality uh, matters. Um, we are looking forward uh, for an effective partnership with the Armenian Relief Society and the Women World Banking. Uh, and uh, we are interested also to study your uh, analysis um, and research, especially those related to the low-income countries, and to see uh, to what extent we can make it applicable uh, in the context of microeconomic uh, projects. So perhaps I'll stop here and allow others to Thank you very much. We put it all together.
are much better than, uh, <laughs> than we could have. Um, are there any questions from panelists to each other? We'll start right here. <laughs> I'd love to ask Ambassador Franco a question because it's something that, that kind of bedevils us a little bit. Um, empowerment is such an overworked word, and, and I'm just curious whether you've seen in any of the work you've done, is there a, is there a real link that you've, you've seen or that's been documented between economic empowerment and political empowerment? I, I, it actually relates to the question I was going to ask you. <laughs> interesting is that actually I do a lot of work in Jordan. I'm there almost every two months with the women members of parliament and I need to talk to you about that. <laughs> and also Malawi. Um, as far as empowerment goes, women tend to think of themselves, as you mentioned, as doing nothing. In Jordan, I was speaking with a group of women and went around the room, asked them each to describe what they're doing. And one of them said, I do nothing. And I said to her, how many children do you have? She said, nine. <laughs> and she makes cheese and sells cheese. <laughs> and I said to her, don't ever say again, I do nothing. When we talk about empowerment, some of it is just working with women to see who they are and what they do. And it's very difficult for women to see themselves as leaders. As I mentioned, I work with basket weavers and with widows who have, who have businesses. The basket weavers have their own banking system. And the widows make in Coke bottles, this is in Kenya, in Coke bottles will make a, a concoction that's soap. And they sell this, women sell eggs in the market. All of this is about empowerment. And it's not so different than political empowerment. I have to tell you, I do the same training with the basket weavers, the Maasai women, and with the members of parliament, and I do this training with Microsoft women. It's not any different. It's about looking at who they are, finding their passion, speaking from their heart, and going forward, moving forward. And sometimes it's very hard for women to see them, that in themselves, and that's why the training is so important. It gives them, even with one training session, whether it's women in politics or women in agriculture, certainly, they are leaders. They need to negotiate prices. They need to learn how to work in the world and to take their place in the world. So I don't see empowerment as so different. And I can tell you I've seen tremendous progress, particularly in Jordan, where it's very difficult to manage, as you said, work and family issues, and I think I mentioned it a few times. This is true with all but it does make a difference. Thank you very much. Um, that was your question. <laughs> uh, let me ask if you got one. Yeah. Um, to both Ambassador Frank and um, Mrs. Skandarian, you know, as we talk about training and participation for women and economic and political advancement for women, in your organization and in, in your uh, experience, where, and this is something that we've um, discussed with Ambassador Nazarian, where do um, the men have a role, or do you set aside as you know something specific for men, and even young men and boys in terms of education? Well, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll think about that in a couple of different ways. I, um, I have never become a bigger champion of diversity than I did in the five years <laughs> that I've been running a woman's organization. Because, the, uh, and again, we, we mentioned it earlier in the panel, the, the quality of the decision that is made by a group that is gender diverse, <coughs> again, the research is very clear, is always, literally 100% of the time, a better decision than the non-diverse group would make. Interestingly, there's some research that was done by the University of Michigan. The people in that, that more heterogeneous group hate it. They feel uncomfortable. They don't think they made a good, a good decision. It was an uncomfortable process because they weren't with lots of homogeneous people. They weren't with people that they were comfortable with. But the outcome of the decision was a better one. And, and so I think for, for us to, to promote True gender diversity at the level of our of our organizations is, is very much a, a part of 
um, the work that we're doing. We've created in 2009 uh, the Center for Microfinance Leadership, where we're training mid-level and senior women. We're training training CEOs and their direct reports in the really hard day-to-day -day management of, of institutions that have you know very very tough bottom line constraints, financial bottom line constraints, but that at the same time have social objectives as well. And what does what does leadership with that balance need to look like? And uh, gender diversity is an absolute uh, absolutely important part of of that uh, of that equation. Um, I work in very diverse settings. And in Afghanistan, for example, when I work with the women members of parliament, it's in secret. Um, because it's dangerous for a group of women to get together. But however, we have taken groups outside of <coughs> Afghanistan as well, and had men and women together. It was really the first time that they've ever talked. And that's very important. In Jordan, my my. It's a very traditional society. People actually think it's more progressive than it is. It's a very traditional society. Mm -hmm. And my translator, who I'm with very often, very traditional tribal man, but over the course of doing this work, he said, he's changed. Mm -hmm. And he understands it now. I think we have to have men there. And beating them over the head and telling them they're jerks doesn't help. <laughs> But what I found does help, and you're going to think this is very strange. This is a very strange observation, but it's one that I, I, I've come to understand. When I work with men, and I want to bring them with me on these trainings, and I want to bring them to men to speak, I found that I need to bring big men. <laughs> um, one of the trainers that I work with is a wonderful man from the Ivory Coast. Uh, fantastic. He's about 6'3 and big. Um, another man that I work with is Greek, very tall and traditional Greek man. I work with them because men view other men according to size. And if you bring a smaller man with you, they'll think, they'll think he's gay, they'll think he's a whim, they'll think... You know. And that has been, you know, luckily for women, we don't have to deal with those prejudices. But, I mean, I'm 5'1". So. But for men, right now in history, this is a truth. And these men that have more heft, like our ambassador, <laughs> when they speak on behalf of women and speak about their daughters, it has an an enormous effect. But we can't do this alone. It doesn't make sense. And we're here talking about equality, not talking about just getting women something. But it's about men, and it's about our sons, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, um, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Stephanie to answer the question herself. <laughs> Actually, this is something um, that will be new for the Armenian Relief Society, and really, it's in, it's thanks to Ambassador uh, Nazarian. We've um, been in discussions with him, and he has sort of planted this seed um, in our mind. And again, sort of that conversation, the gender diverse conversation, not just the ARS discussing amongst itself, but bringing in partners like the Armenian government. Um, and he has been the one to um, really plant the fact that he would like to see education and training starting um, at a very young age for boys in Armenia um, in terms of um, you know, social education, financial education, political education, um, to ha change the norms um, so that it's really acceptable and in, in part of every day that women are equal partners on that level. So thanks to him. Thanks so much. We have time for two or three questions from the floor. We've got one back there and one here. Okay, let's take those two. Thank you so much. Can you oh, tell us who you are? Sure. Uh, my name is Gaina Panjang. Um, can everyone hear me? Or Okay. Okay. My name is Karina Bondan. I'm a student um, at, Compar at Lehigh University studying comparative and international education. Thank you so much for the opportunity to ask a question, Dr. Yu. 
Um, I'm ask, I'd like to ask the panelists, um, I, I appreciate your comments this morning, but I'm a little bit interested to see how perhaps Ambassador Nazayan, you can actually give us a little bit more about what's going on in terms of the governmental level, but in terms of the UN Secu Security Council Resolution 1325, specifically about empowering women, I really didn't get to hear too much discussion or I'd like to know maybe if ARS is being involved with or being uh, approached in, the, in a workforce or working group to support the Armenian government in adopting that um, Security Council resolution because obviously a lot of what we're talking about here really needs to focus and bring that into Armenia, especially with the context of Armenia since Armenia is extremely different than all of those countries you mentioned, um, Ms. Frank. So I think that we, we can't necessarily compare our country, this country, with theirs, but in terms of some of the things that you mentioned, I agree with, but I don't, I don't agree because I think some of the context really needs to be looked into deeper. So I, I'd like to see if you guys can, um, and the Ambassador, if you can tell us what progress we're at. I think maybe other members in the room would be interested to know. Thank you Thank so you much. name card out and I need to get theirs and so we're going to stop this session and we're all going to start talking to each other. Uh, we have at least five minutes in this room so you're welcome to get up and talk to each other and you need to meet with Ambassador Frank because she's done work with disabled women in Kenya. <laughs>